Airing on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week's episode is a rebroadcast of a 2019 podcast, and we'll have a transcript up in the near future. We hope you enjoy this and invite you to check out our past episodes stretching back to 2010 at our website, thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, as well as our recent venture into transcripts by visiting tfsr.wtf slash zines. If you appreciate our efforts and want to support us getting conversations like this into more and more hands, eyes, and ears, you can check out tfsr.wtf slash support for suggestions. This week I spoke with Nava Smolish, author of the essay The Opposite of Rape Culture is Nurturance Culture, which became the seed of her book Turn This World Inside Out, The Emergence of Nurturance Culture. This book was published by AK Press and was written under the pseudonym Nora Samara. We talk about harm, entitlement as related to positions of power like masculinity and whiteness in our cultures, the need for connection ingrained into our biology and sociality, accountability, and healing, among other topics. You can learn more about Nava and find further reading up at norasamaran.com. You can also find a list of suggested further readings by searching How to Not Re-Injure Survivors. Next weekend is the Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair, or ACAB, happening in Asheville, North Carolina. Events start on Friday with a welcome table at Firestorm from 1 to 7 p.m. During that period, there will also be presentations on veganism and nonviolent direct action, transnational and indigenous poetry, anti-racism in Appalachia, the revolutionary abolitionist movement, and anarchism in Puerto Rico. That night, Pansy Fest begins with a show at Sly Grog Lounge at 7 p.m., and this sparks a weekend of activities from 11 a.m. till about 2 a.m. around the city. If you want to learn more about either series of events, you can check out acab2019.noblogs.org or pansycollective.org. Or give a re-listen to our August 4th episode of The Final Straw. And please come visit our table if you're in town on Saturday or Sunday and say hi. We'll be at the Mothlight. There are some updates on the case of anarchist prisoner Eric King, including some call-outs for help funding his medical needs and vegan food for him at his current site. Um, but you can find that up at supporteric.king.org, and stay tuned to our website and podcast stream for some special audios about him coming up this week. We're lucky enough to include Sean Swain in this week's broadcast. If you've been missing him on your audio emissions, you can find a link to his audio essays up at our website. He produces one every week. And you can find updates on him at seanswain.org or now follow him on Twitter at Swain Rocks. Please be aware that his 50th birthday is coming up on September 12th, so send him some love and kindness. Also, if you're in town for ACAB, swing by the final straw table on Saturday, August 24th before noon to participate in a birthday surprise for Sean. Shh, don't tell him. Well, would you please introduce yourself for the audience? Hey, my name's Nava, and I am currently in Massachusetts. I don't know protocol here because I'm a visitor, but my understanding is that I'm on Nipmuc and Pocomtuck territory in western Massachusetts right now. Would you talk a little bit about how you came to write Turn the World Inside Out, um, the emergence of nurturance culture, and who it's intended for and what you hope that it can achieve? Huh. It kind of wrote itself through me, so it's hard for me to say um, this is the reason I wrote it. I had personal reasons for writing it um, that were trying to understand things that were happening to me in my life <laughs> that were just really about trying to understand my own experiences. Um, and also because I stopped being able to read for a while, like there was, um, uh, for about six months I couldn't read at all. And then I slowly was working my way back up and I teach literature for my job. So, um, I needed to figure out if I was going to be able to write and read again. And I, I was writing this blog just to have a space that was very, very free and very personal where I wasn't worried about what I was saying. I was really listening to myself. And the nurturance essay came out of that. Um, and then because the nurturance essay went all over the place, then after that I was able to write this book. And I guess that's the short story of how it happened. <laughs> but I don't know if that gets to the heart of the question. I think you're kind of asking something else. Well. I mean, if it so, it, it started out of your need to express yourself, and um, 
and then just sort of went like online viral, I think is how it's been described. Mm -hmm. The the title of that essay, which listeners may have have read or come across, is The Opposite of Rape Culture is Nurturance Culture. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. How did you see that spread and how did people like engage with that? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so there were a lot of different ways. Some of them are funny. For example... I did not mean it to say, but many people received it as, and I looked back on it and I was like, okay, I guess it does kind of say that for men to get closer to other men, like cis men particularly, to get closer to other men, um, but all men, like trans men and cis men also, a lot of folks took it as like, oh, we should build relationships with each other. Um, and that wasn't what I was saying. <laughs> and it's been beautiful. And I, it touched on, there's, I think what I hadn't fully understood, but that makes sense to me is that there's this profound need that a lot of masculine identified folks feel to be intimate with each other and that's denied and I think part of the reason it spread so quickly was partly because it like created room for that closeness um, I was actually saying you know challenge each other so that you can be better to everybody else in your life <laughs> mm. but it has fostered a lot more openness between men talking to one another which I think is beautiful some of the funny downsides are that it's resulted in like all male panels on masculinity <laughs> or all male events where only men are invited to come mm. and that's not what I meant <laughs> mm-hmm. like, I, I think it's nice that you're all connecting with each other but I don't think I meant to create like another uh, you know the, 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 yeah like sorry go ahead like what boys club boys club like we have had all male spaces before in the world and I'm not really I wasn't really suggesting that, that we should reproduce that <laughs> Um, But some of the other things that grew out of it, I think what was happening for me at the time, I was writing about things happening to me, and I was also learning about uh, things that were happening to other folks that I'm not targeted by. So I was like, I sat in on a class that Rachel Zeller has taught at McGill, who's this incredible, brilliant black feminist scholar and organizer who's from the U.S., but she's based in Montreal now. Um, and so, you know, some mutual friends introduced us and I just, I just sat in on her class and it blew my mind and I learned an incredible amount in that class. And I didn't write about that because I felt like, you know, it's not my place and like, you know, it's not my knowledge or my wisdom or stay in your lane, like all of that stuff, but was underneath kind of bubbling. And I was thinking about it as a white person trying to understand it. As I was writing about masculinity, I was also thinking about racism. Um, and so when the book happened, I was like, well, clearly when we're talking about nurturance culture, it resonates more around around more kinds of violence and disconnection. If the core idea is that, you know, it's not new, right? This is stuff that I had learned over many years, like reading a lot of different people that like oppressors also lose something, right? That we, we lose, if you're, let's say like a white person in the system, you lose a part of yourself too. And I had sort of understood that that was happening for people who were positioned as men that I was close to, that part of them was like, disconnected in some way not for everybody but for certain specific people that I'd gotten close to and um and in all kinds of ways I think like existing in a gender binary cuts parts of us off that are really here and that are bubbling up and wanting to come to the surface you know for everybody I think not only for trans and gender queer folks but even for cis folks I'd say that there's and this is what Serena writes about in that chapter on um on gender is that like when we center the folks who are the most targeted by systems of oppression and center that knowledge and then make it the core of what we're looking at, that opens up freedom. It creates a better world for targeted folks, but it also opens up freedom for everybody else who's existing inside oppressive systems. Um, And so I'm kind of like, I've experienced a bit of both, like as a white person with Canadian citizenship, who's like born in, you know, born in Canada, I have a lot of privilege. And then as like a working class person, as as a woman who's experienced a lot of harm in my life, as someone who's experienced poverty, you know, both intergenerationally and intermittently in my life. And then also my dad's a Holocaust survivor. So like, it's close in my family. It's for my people, my age, it's usually two generations away. And for me, it's my dad. So, and my uncles Mm. and my aunt. Um, so like, I feel like I had this funny place straddling both oppressor and oppressed experiences. And I was just like putting these pieces together, but I knew that I wasn't the right person to talk about race and racism or colonization. So when the book happened and the, um, the possibility arose to connect, um, what I was learning to these bigger systems of, of harm, I was like, well, this has to be relational. This has to be in dialogue with people who really have that knowledge. Cause I'm not the yeah. right person to talk to that. And that's how that grew. So I was like, yeah, we're just going to do conversations, you know, and learn from each other. 
I really, really appreciate the fact that you you made it so conversational and brought in those dialogues and made space for the guests to bring in other points and sort of like push back and challenge. And it it actually made it a lot more dynamic. And I think as insightful as the essays that you wrote were, um, like you and and curating like who you brought in because you knew that they had some like things that we all could learn from. I I really appreciate that as a reader. No, you know the funny thing is I don't feel like I did. I don't know that I curated exactly so much as I just opened up and reached out into my own community. Because one of the other things that I was really trying to do was um, I didn't put out a call for papers or anything like that. It was really just wanting to be like, this knowledge is already here. People know. You don't have to have a degree on something to have expertise on it, right? I I had done, for a long time, I'd been an organizer in like a grassroots migrant justice organization that was led by folks of color and it was led pr- primarily by people who'd been through the immigration system. And one of the things that they taught us that we learn there was like the expertise comes from the from the bottom it comes from the people who have the lived experience that is expertise that you look to and you hold up and it's wisdom it's it's more valid than the kinds of stuff that I was learning in school mm. um, which often like piggybacks and borrows on that knowledge <laughs> um, and that's just now really central to how I think that if you want to really understand what has to change, you look to the people that have that expertise. And I was lucky in my community to have like relationships. And I just realized, Oh, I'm having coffee with this friend or I'm working out with that friend and they know this stuff. So let's talk and let's make a chapter together. It kind of grew really organically, which was a little bit tricky for my publisher. Cause I was like, I need a chapter like this, but I'm not going to go ask someone. It has to just happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meant it took longer than maybe expected. <laughs> But the relationships are really genuine as a result. Like we're, you know, it matters to me to build trust and not just be like, hey, famous person, will you be in my book? Because I'm Mm -hmm. really not seeking power at all. Like quite the opposite. I really value being able to share power and that this is everybody's knowledge that we're creating together through pushing each other and challenging each other and being excited to grow across our differences. Mm. You know? Yeah. Was was there, and it's just kind of off off the cuff question, but was there any... um, anything about your choice of writing under a pseudonym that reflected the like wanting to not make it about personal power yeah. or yeah. yeah yeah for sure uh for sure <laughs> yeah it feels like this came through me in a bunch of different levels um first the the essays which were written first and i you know i don't even necessarily still agree with everything in those essays they were what i was thinking at the time they just grew really intuitively they almost wrote themselves and then I wanted to just give it to the world in a way that wasn't really too connected to me, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Cause it feels like I didn't make up a lot of that stuff. Like a lot of it is things that I've learned and that I, it's implicit at some point. If you learn something 15 years ago, it's there and it's hard to track back. Um, so when we were making the book from the blogs, I had to go back and like resource everything and reference everything. And it feels like it's not really about, me as a person it's relational and that's gotten really reinforced in the last little while like of course Mm -hmm. then once you're like putting a book out and then um asked to do you know represent the book then there's a certain Mm -hmm. responsibility that comes in where you're like well i did make this book so i'm responsible for it um and you can start to feel like you have to have everything figured out and i definitely don't Mm -hmm. and i'm not trying to be like hey i have all the solutions it's really just I want to be in conversation and particularly right now when we're, we're experiencing really different kinds of harm. Like the harms that are most ratcheted up right now are not directly targeting me a lot, although it's creeping over more and more to targeting me like the tree of life shooting, Mm -hmm. you know, targeted people that I know and that are, you know, it's, I am in a community that, we we can't um, expect that we'll stay safe just because we stay out of the mess, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's been a mistake in the past to be like, oh, you know, just keep your head down and it won't affect you. That's not true. Eventually we all get affected one way or another. But I'm not in the most targeted group right now. So it feels like there's this distance and a gulf in life experience. And we don't have to necessarily be best friends to have solidarity. Like, it's okay to have intimacy with folks that are like you Mm-hmm. while also reaching across and showing up for people like and I've, I've been scared and since Trump came in I've been scared I've been I don't know like a lot of people I've I had that collapse when it first happened and then I had to understand that this wasn't new for a lot of people it was just stepped up yeah 
that this this kind of violence is the foundation of Western culture, and it's been there the whole time, but suddenly it's apparent and increasing in pace. And I've been in kind of paralysis mode, and over the last little while with the um, a lot of the ice blockades um, mm. and, like, resistance finally really kicking up in a loud way with, like... Uh, some of like with Cosecha and like some of the migrant justice groups that are just like fighting and organizing, I'm finally feeling hopeful and feeling less scared and less paralyzed. And I just went to this um, training recently that really helped because it's like, no, you can do this. Ordinary people can do this. You don't have to be mm-hmm. somebody special. It's always been ordinary people who were, who were stepping in, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's in a way that has each other's backs, whether or not we're, going to automatically listen to the same music and wear the same clothes and like each other. Like, you know, (laughs) how do you build trust when you don't automatically have the same background or the same culture so that you can protect each other? I like the fact that that starting with the first essay, you, you bring in the concept of, or the concept is brought in constantly of like, Inter- interconnectedness between communities and between peoples that are affected by these like disconnects and displacements um, and since you brought up the shooting like one of the we were already set to talk but one of the reasons um, that I really felt compelled to to try to get this conversation out soon and I hope to have more mm-hmm. on the topic is um, like in the response to the El Paso shooting and the Dayton shooting, uh, a listener mm-hmm. and a friend had read a tweet by Bree Newsom that had that this guy didn't disagree with, but he just didn't fully understand. And so we like had a chat where uh, she named mm-hmm. one of the causes of the shooting to be um, male entitlement. And mm-hmm. so we sort of had like a nice chat about that. Um, and it's like mass shootings are this really spectacularized amplification of the violence that's already that's already so present in a really sick patriarchal like heterosexist mm-hmm. white settler anti-black like I could go on listing like mm-hmm. ableist mm-hmm. society that mm-hmm. we live in or that we both live in even on different sides of the border they're like similar they're cousins mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but it like this sort of violence is always like bubbling underneath the surface or it's like impacting people mm-hmm. on a more like personal one-on-one basis that doesn't make the news through like mm-hmm. familial violence or um, yeah. violence or microaggressions yeah. on the subway or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it seems like there's like an issue of, of like people engaging people who feel their privileges or entitlement slipping away, engaging yeah. anger or fear or loss through otherization of of yeah. people that are already marginalized by the system, um, could you talk about some of the like insights that putting this project together or or your conversations have brought you that yeah. maybe like listeners could understand about like the the connection between like a fear of a loss of entitlement and and lashing out and that relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about that story that I think we've talked about before, right? But. Um, that book, Why Does He Do That by Lindsay mm. Bancroft, I found really helpful. Is that kind of mm. the stuff you're thinking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a story that Lindy Bancroft uses in this book that um, after I wrote the nurturance essay, because at the time when I was writing the nurturance essay, I was deep, deep, deep in empathy for someone who was harming me and several other people who I had observed causing harm. And I was trying to feel as deeply into that experience as I could to try to understand it. And so I got part of the way to understanding, but I missed a big piece of the picture. Um, And as I moved away from that, um, I think it has its place, but a whole bunch of friends put this book in my hands and were like, you need to read this book. There's a big piece of this puzzle you're not understanding. And I read it and I was, it helped explain so much more. It put into words things that I had felt and known, but I hadn't been able to articulate. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a story that he tells that I told um, to my nine-year-old godson who was trying to understand why he's kind of cute and he has this curly hair and adults are always touching him and putting their hands Mm -hmm. in his hair and he has he's kind of has some sensory issues and he hates even people who love him he has ways that he likes to be touched and not to be touched like you give him a firm squeeze hug you don't like gently touch his hair because it makes him he doesn't like it and so all these adults are always touching him without asking first and he just he's learned how to say i don't like when people touch me But we were talking at dinner, and he was asking, "Why are people? Why do people always do this?" And um, his mom was trying to explain that he's a kid, and so they don't really listen to him. And I realized this story would help, and it would also teach him. You know, he's also a big kid, and he has to learn about other people's boundaries too. Mm-hmm. And um, the story is 
there's a little boy and from the time he's very young, his family tells him and they really believe and they tell him that there's this beautiful big um, area, this piece of land that belongs to the family, they say. And they tell him, for now, while you're a child, it, you're, in, because you're so generous, you're allowing the community to use this land. But it's really ours, and when we, when you grow up, you're going to inherit it, and it will belong to you. And you're just allowing people to fish and hunt and camp and enjoy the territory, the land that um, that our family owns. And the boy goes many times to visit the land, and he walks around on it, and he feels really good about his generosity as he sees people camping and enjoying the land. Um, and he knows that when he grows up, it'll be his. But for now, they're sharing it. And then the time comes when he comes of age, and his family says, okay, now now it's time. And he goes to the land, and he says to the people that are there, all right, well, all of these years, you know, you've enjoyed our generosity, and the time has come for me to take the land back, so please, time to leave. And it's not actually true that it belongs to his family. That's They've been mistaken, and he's been mistaken, but he's been told this since he was very young. Um, actually, the land belongs to the community. You can think of it as crown land, or you can think of it as like a state park or a, you know, a big a big public park. Um, and he's just wrong. <laughs> it's not just not the case that that belongs to him. And so the people there are a little bit like, who are, who do you think you are? Like, this isn't yours. And we're allowed to be here. This belongs to everyone. And then he gets angry because he feels like he's being pushed back on or, you know, not only are they not appreciating how generous he's been, but Mm -hmm. they're not, they're refusing to leave and they're like, they're taking what's his and he gets angry. He starts, you know, pushing their things. He he starts taking their things and trying to get it off the land and breaking their stuff. And, you know, they get mad at him and it's understandable that they get mad at him because he's behaving really badly, but he's behaving badly because he believes that something that is his by rights is being pushed back on in a way that's bullying him or oppressing him. And Lundy Bancroft uses that story to describe the making of of an abusive man. So someone who believes that they not only have the right to their own body, but your body too. And I've known people who have this mindset. And it's not to say that this is generalized or that all men have it. Of course, many, many people can grow up in a system that encourages that kind of system thinking and nonetheless be kind and empathetic and caring and have good boundaries. But that the culture might foster it. So if it's not being countered at home, you might, all of the TV, all of the movies, you know, all of the pop culture, video games, like it teaches that if you're born into this particular type of body and that is who you identify as and if you do all the right things, you're owed certain things. Like you're owed a pretty wife and you're owed a nice house and you're owed an income that can support a family and you're owed a certain amount of deference. You know, you're owed not only to be treated as an equal but to be um, deferred to and that that's yours by rights. And so there's a mindset that treats that as natural and says, well... You know, if this woman or non cis dude expects to be an equal, that they're somehow imposing, that they're taking up more than their fair share. And it's a mistake. It's not accurate. But people can really experience it as that, as like an imposition on their God-given rights or their natural rights. And I think of it like, you know... I, I try to, I've tried to extrapolate that and understand that, what it would be like, what it means for me growing up as a white person in this society, that like... I even think of it in a simpler way. Like if you grew up sitting on three quarters of the couch and the other person Mm -hmm. who's the same size as you only gets a quarter, you might not notice because you're comfortable and you've been there the whole time, but they're getting squished. When they sort of push you and say, hey, move over, you might feel like you're being oppressed. Yeah, there's a a quote. There's a quote that's in the book that I don't know if that was attributed to Audre Lorde or or what, but it sort of like said something similar that really struck out to me and I wish I had it accessible right now. But yeah, if if you're used to a... Uh, level of privilege, equality feels like oppression. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's the mystery quote. No one knows. It's mm. a rabbit hole. Um, many people have used it. No one knows where it comes from, and no one's ever. Been, I have not yet found. Of all the people that I've seen who quote it, people are like, "We don't know who said this," which is beautiful. Cause yeah, it's all shared knowledge, and I'm like, I wish the yeah. whole thing could be like that. <laughs> right. Um, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. That's exactly it. Mm. You feel like you're being pushed back on, but you don't realize that you have been stomping on people and not even realizing it. Because all you're, it's like gravity. All you're doing is walking, mm-hmm. but the whole system is structured so that your experience of just walking is walking on other people, and it's set up that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then when people push back, you just feel that you're being pushed on, and people can get really dangerous, right? Like, 
push back on white people's sense of everybody's the same and white people get really dangerous, like scary mm-hmm. dangerous. With and a yeah, very that fragile lot- like undercoat and just feeling like any sort of pushback is a is an is an attack on us and our integrity or our right to right to exist. Yeah, yeah, and that it's racism, like reverse racism, you know, all of which is just such a profound lack of empathy, like a profound inability to really recognize what's happening around you. And I'm I'm experiencing both of those. Like I, I've spent years trying to learn and recognize and listen deeply to people of color who are talking about their experiences, whether through reading or listening or organizing, you know, like slowly, slowly trying to build relationships where you keep showing up and people are like, yeah, you said this up thing and you're like oh thanks and then you keep coming back <laughs> mm-hmm. and being like okay cool I'm gonna keep learning <laughs> like and I think we need that we need to just keep showing up and keep learning and being really really open to growing our ability to recognize things that our entire conditioning teaches us not to recognize and that's you know the same kind of thing that I've been asking that I was hoping that men in my life would do um, you know with mixed success <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah um, and it, it can be painful to do it because it means questioning foundations that we grew up with. This is the final straw number, so goodness. You're hearing my chat with Dr. Nava Smallish about her recent book, Turn This World Inside Out, The Emergence of Nurturance Culture, published by AK Press. I mean, so you were talking about the, like the, 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 the way that people are, have the expectations built, built for us, um... And and I guess the way that oh, there was something in the last thing that you that you said kind of sparked me thinking about another story about a child that you that you relate in the mm. in the book, um, mm. you know where where the kind of activity that you were saying was good modeling just now we you know of like going and being in space and listening to people and then when somebody when like a person of color for instance says uh, you did this kind of thing being able to take that and be like a oh all right. Thank you for sharing that. That must have been like an yeah, like that's to share. That's generous. Like that's mm-hmm. a gift, right? Yeah, to but receive it as a gift. That's like, and that one has to be ready to receive something like that, and be be of a mental state where that is viewed as a gift. Um, yeah. So here's the thing. I think I'm not disconnect in, but it might be in a big roundabout way because a lot of that stuff isn't new, right? Like a lot of that is things that I've learned previously and were just floating around for me and that came out in the writing because I was trying to understand them. Often I write as I'm learning, actually. So it's not me being like, I'm an expert and I'm going to tell you what to do. It's me absorbing, oh, this is what that person meant. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. now I understand because I write to think. Um, so, But if there's, any way, if there's anything in the writing that I think might be a little bit new, it's the thinking of it and thinking of all of this long tradition of, of challenging oppression that comes for a long ways before me and I'm not one of the main people who's written it but connecting it into the nervous system Mm. I'm like why is it that we get these defensive reactions and that our entire sense of self collapses when someone's like hey that thing you did is a super white person thing to do please stop it's it's like hurting people (laughs) why do we collapse like why does that happen why do white people are why do white people get super defensive and crazy (laughs) and also what do we have as a gift in us that can counter it and I think it was through some struggles that I was having. Um, so I have a dissociative disorder caused by gendered violence, um, among other things. Um, and as I was learning, initially when I found that out, I didn't have words and I couldn't access words for any of the things that were happening to me. But as I was healing that, I was integrating layers of myself that had been shamed. Like shame had uh, shame and terror when I was developing had Form, had caused these fragments to happen. And as I was integrating, I was like learning that actually that's very common, that almost all of us have parts of ourselves that have been fragmented off so fully that we can't access them. Not everybody has it to the extent that I did, and some people have it even more than me, but it's actually not unusual. It's a way that our systems cope with shame when we're very young. I was learning about that because um, what I, like dissociative disorder is, is caused externally it's not something you're born with it's caused through attachment trauma or breaking of belonging and so I just was reading all this stuff about attachment and attachment and uh, attachment trauma and betrayal I trust betrayal trauma and meanwhile I was putting that into everything that I had been learning for many years about racism and kind of understanding that one of the things that's so messed up and causes such compounded trauma 
is not necessarily an act of racism or an act of systemic violence. It's that plus the bystanding and the normalizing of it. That there's a sense of betrayal when some when harm is happening and the humans around you mm. don't see it or can't see it. There's a fundamental break in our sense that our nervous systems require to know that we are connected to the other humans mm-hmm. that we are close to. Usually specific other humans, like attachment is attached to specific other people. Um, but I think that there's a gift in our nervous systems that allows us to understand our ecological belonging and our social belonging in a less intimate sense, but still very deep. Like when we go into the forest or you're in a wild place, our nervous system grew, developed over many, 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 many eons to be part of webs of life. And it's not an idea, it's a physiological reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what this Western culture has denied and told us not to notice, not to pay attention to. We're all individuals. We're supposed to bootstrap ourselves to success. We're not supposed to need each other too much. Needs are bad. The lone wolf, like riding off into the sunset is a good thing, you know. The cow- I'm mixing metaphors there, but like the yeah. cowboy, right? You know, you know what I mean. Yeah. But that's valorized. And that's not our physiological or biological reality. And as a cultural worldview, it denies a lot of physical reality. And when I was writing in the Nurturance Culture essay, Nothing in this child's world gives him any signpost, and yet it's true. Mm-hmm. I was trying to feel towards this deeper sense of belonging that our nervous systems give us in concentric circles. Yes, we belong. We're more intimate with a set certain people. We have children and partners and parents and siblings and aunts and uncles, and it grows from these profound intimacies where we we're, com- we're meant to be completely held. But it doesn't end there, and I think what's weird about psychology is that it just describes that, and it doesn't understand that maybe our nervous systems are also part of our ecological sense of connectedness um, in the earth and in other hum- with other humans. And that, for me, is where empathy comes in, where like we have a part of ourselves that can feel what other people are feeling, mm-hmm. it's capable of it, but it's not automatic, it has to be honed, and it can be killed in us, it can be, it can be numbed in us or shut down. And if we want to feed the kind of culture that can live in balance ecologically and also sort of belong with one another socially, be fully human, be fully expressed, then we need to recognize that our nervous systems are built this way and cultivate that gift. And when that fails, that's when you get things, or when it's not cultivated, you know, that's when you get people growing up, mixing up their internal experience of shame because they don't have connection to that wholeness with, you know, that external person is making me feel bad and I should punish them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where that story comes in. We're like, you know, at, at six, he's outgrown this. He laughs about this now. Cause we, I told him that he was in the book and, mm-hmm. um, and he, you know, he doesn't really understand what that means, but he kind of got a kick out of the fact that people are reading a story about him. <laughs> and, um, and we, we told him like, well, you know, the reason it's interesting is not just cause it's about kids. It's cause there are adults who don't know that. And he's just yeah. like, what? That's so silly. <laughs> silly is a good word for it. He didn't know, but by eight he knew. <laughs> you know, because we worked with him to be like, yeah, no, you you did this thing that hurt somebody. We love you. You're good. You belong fundamentally. That's unbreakable. But like, go say sorry, or like, go go. Not necessarily say sorry, like in the you know shame way, but go check what that person needs. Mm-hmm. Like, I love. There's this close friend of mine who I've learned a ton from, my friend Shania, and. One of the first things I learned from her about parenting kids, and everybody, I'm not proposing that I know how to parent, like everybody's going to parent differently and that's fine. It's more just that I think about this in terms of adult relationships too. Because often what kids need, grownups need too, Mm -hmm. is when somebody hurts somebody else, you don't go, so you're sorry, because that's often very fake and superficial. Mm -hmm. You ask what they need. So with her kids, if one kid hurt another kid, she'd be like, she'd model, she'd turn to the kid who got hurt and be like, are you okay? Do you want a hug? What do you need? Like, It's more about meeting the person's need than it is about shaming the person who did something wrong, although an apology can go a long way. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And to teach that, you know, watching kids learn it, because as I've been healing, I've been watching healthy parenting. I've also been reparenting myself and then thinking about my adult relationships, too. Mm -hmm. That's a roundabout story, but does that answer that a little bit? Yeah, awesome. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN.
listening to Dissident Island Radio. Live every first and third Friday of the month at 9pm GMT. Check out www.dissidentisland.org for downloads and more. Yeah, there was, I mean, just to, to get to the specific, a, a child, like, does something out of frustration that ends up hurting their parent and then mistakes the feeling of sorrow for having hurt or being told that they've hurt their parent for being accused of being a bad person, right? Which is like that kind of... Yeah, they, that, the, like, yeah. A lot of people are like, you know, if, if someone's told, like, that thing that you just did is racist, then they hear that as, well, you're, you're racist. Bad. Um, you're you are this thing as opposed to you are this person that did this thing, which is reparable. Yeah. If a, you are this thing, that's not reparable. That's a statement of like uh, essence. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then of course there's the whole like you know it's not about you at your essence having something wrong with you. It's that this culture we live in positions us to cause harm, um, mm. and so it's not that you are or are not racist. That's like not the point. It's like. You, when you take a step, you're taking a step in which gravity has been structured to cause harm to people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> and to work with that and be like, oh, okay, so I have to step differently. I have to like recognize the gravity that I'm operating in. It also kind of sets us up for failure in a way of like, and this is not just the people that are that are like, I'm, um, you know, that are causing the harm. But I think I experience that society teaches us to think in terms of essentialism and putting people in yeah. boxes or like saying someone is this thing therefore they should go to prison for the rest of their life because yes, they didn't yes. Ever to be irremediably exactly yeah to be like a degenerate human who can mm-hmm. yeah yeah or to be a you know the type of person who xyz yeah and then that creates these swimming upstream experiences for people who are having all this shit thrown at them that's got nothing to do with who they are at all mm-hmm Especially because those values are like thrown, especially down the social hierarchy on on more and more people and accumulate yeah. in all these intersecting ways. Like, yeah, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. I like how yeah. in the introduction you you started off with stories of of uh, the Windsor House as this like <laughs> experiment of of looking at like just sort of observing kids who have accountability with each other and feel this. And are, are like socialized to have this interconnectedness with each other, but maybe socialized. I don't know if that's like too hard of a word, yeah. too like reeducationy. If it's something that that fulfills a lot of their need for like nurturance and trust that they can hear critique from other people around them and know that it's not yeah. a judgment of their essential being. I think that's really inspirational. Even more for me that the kids, nobody's you're not powerless there because if you get hurt by somebody, you can get hurt. You can get a remedy. Mm. And and particularly, I think that holding the circle because what I'm what I'm learning and really understanding more profoundly is that you have to have a container in order to have values that you decide is what this group of people are going to do. You have to be like, we set baseline expectations for how we treat one another in this circle, mm-hmm. and if you can't meet those, those are condition those are the conditions required to be part of this particular circle of humans. And otherwise, you have this strange free for all where people are like, "Well, who decides?" And I'm like, "We decide. <laughs> mm-hmm. We decide that it's not okay to do this or that harmful thing to other people." And I was recently, I recently had an incredible experience for me. Anyway, I don't know if the person who caused harm will agree. Maybe it'll take five or ten years before they agree. <laughs> but I recently was at a retreat where we had a pretty tight container. It was like 35 people. And the organizers all had long, deep relationships with each other. They'd known each other for years, and they had a lot of trust. And there was someone who was, like, pushing boundaries, um, you know, like, asking to cuddle with people who may may or may not have been there for that. And, you know, then, like, getting closer with folks, like, asking to take clothes off who were, like, not saying no, but not really enthusiastically saying yes either, and just kind of kept doing stuff like that. And um, after asking them to stop, and then they, they couldn't, 
sort of, they weren't in a place where they could take the feedback in a way that would allow them to stop quickly enough. And it was a short, it was just a week long thing. And we were there for something else. We were not there for that. So the organizers were like, okay, we've asked you to stop. You haven't stopped. This is changing the dynamic of the group. People are not here for this. And we can't take the whole rest of the week just to work on this with you because that'll stop us from doing the goals that we came here for. We're not doing that. They asked the person to leave, but I've never before seen it done in such, I was like, this is real. We can do it when we have a solid container. The person was asked to leave, but there wasn't like malicious gossip or back talk. It was just like, this is the thing they were doing. We understand that they also have their own history and their own reasons and their own pain. And this isn't that they're a bad person, but what they were doing was causing them to like disrupt this space. They've been asked to leave. They were given an ex. They were some people bought them a bus ticket. People took them to the bus. We checked in to make sure they got home, got across the border. And one person that they asked for and who agreed committed to be their like ongoing contact person for the next weeks and months to be, like check in, see how they're doing, do this work with them, so that the people that were they were impacting did not have to do any of it. Like mm. the directly affected folks got to just go on with their week. They did not have to process with that person. They did not have to make sure they were okay because the rest of the circle held it. The people who were not getting directly affected moved into one or two of them and then the organizers moved into that role and it was amazing and then when it was explained to the group why that decision had been taken it wasn't like man that person sucks and there's good and bad people it was like you know if they've been conditioned through patriarchy to not be able to read cues they have to do that work this isn't the place to do that work but we understand that they have their person and they have their own history of pain but mm -hmm. we're censoring the needs of the people who chose to be here who don't want to have to deal with that mm -hmm. um, and you know, we ask that people not gossip and not be mean about it, and we're just going to go on with the program. And that was respected. That's awesome. Like, there was a little bit of working it out. Like, people who were friends with that person needed to know what, what had happened. There was a lot of transparency about the process. And then the next day, people were like, back to the trainings we came here to do, and there wasn't a lot of nastiness about it at all. Neither towards the people harmed, nor the person causing harm. Just like, okay, the container was held, on with the program, someone's mm -hmm. checking in with them, Folks are checking in with the folks who've been harmed. Their needs are taking priority. And I, we were all just like, this can work. <laughs> <laughs> I've, now I understand how it works, but it only works when you have a circle yeah. and the person and, and belonging in that circle is contingent on agreeing to respect those ways of doing things. This is the final straw on Embers of Goodness. You're hearing my chat with Dr. Nava Smallish about her recent book, Turn This World Inside Out, The Emergence of Nurturance Culture, published by AK Press. The final straw is a member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hee -hee. This is M1, M-A uno, M-A de la gente, comprende y entende, you feel me? I'm one half of dead press, to tell it like it is, everything is political rap duo. Here holding my middle finger up to imperialism worldwide. And you in tune right now to the rebel beat. The Rebel Beat is a monthly podcast of radical political music across different genres and across different continents. It's the mixtape to a riot against police brutality. It's your nightly newscast set to bass and beats. It's protest anthems from Hong Kong to Istanbul to Ferguson to Montreal. Give it a listen at rebelbeatradio.com or subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms. It's interesting, like, I... Because that makes me think of, uh, I guess, what would, which this wasn't an accountability process. This was like an immediate uh, solution to uh, like a conflict. But, um, mm. but like with accountability processes, like the things that I've witnessed, if, like for the most part, it, at a certain point, like there may be f f faults in the way that a thing is structured or the way that it has like resolution or the way that it communicates with people that have been. Uh, most directly harmed in terms of how that goes, but one of the big mm -hmm. flaws is often the lack of the lack of connectivity, where someone can just like get frustrated, get up, move somewhere else, and yeah. are like they can do that anyway. But where they're like willing to, where their connection to this community, where the harm has taken place, and where they've helped harm people, is so limited that they just feel like they can discard it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they'd be like, oh, you're trying to hold me accountable? Bye. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the many, many kinds of manipulation that some folks do when they're asked to be accountable. I've watched so many of these processes now, and they, if there isn't a strong container, then it's very difficult to be like, um, well, if you want to be in this community, these are standards, you have to meet them, because it's very difficult to say, we care about you and we'll work with you, but you can't take up space publicly or have, grow power. I think there's also a really big difference between, I don't know if this connects to what you're saying or not, but it might, tell me if it does. There's a really big difference between belonging and having power over or being on a stage or self-promoting or like, you know, and in the North American kind of organizing world, there's a funny tension because a lot of us get into it just because we care about things and we want the world to be a better place and we're not trying to be visible in any way. Like, mm. my most comfortable place is a background role. I'm, I'm most comfortable being, like, a runner. You know, I get food. I make people get people places to sleep. Like, I pick people up. Like, that's where I'm comfortable. Mm. I'm very, very, very uncomfortable being public in any way. <laughs> it's not my nature. I'm super introverted. Um, and, like, if this book thing hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing this. And mm -hmm. I have a love-hate relationship with it. I mean, it's fun to build more relationships, but the put it, putting a person above is not something that I feel is really appropriate or mm -hmm. good for movements. Yeah. Um, but there are folks who want to be above and who want to be on stage and who really crave being looked at and attention given to them and, like, becoming gatekeepers. Um, and those folks can do weird things to keep that power. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to distinguish and say, look, if you're someone who, like, for example, the Charlie Glickman case, which is super public, um, I don't know if you followed that at all. It's, in, it's not in my world directly. It's a sex educator kind of world, which is adjacent to mine. So it's been interesting because I've watched it from a distance. It's not my own community. But he's this, like, very powerful sex educator who was pretty pretty well known and was a gatekeeper who could keep this all out on the internet. You can look it up. Um, you know, he... I found out as this was happening that he could decide whether people got work or not. Like he had quite a lot of power and he was doing the kind of subtle manipulative gaslighting abuse for a long time with this one former partner. And it all finally came out and turns out lots of people that had those experiences with him. And many people reached out towards him to say, you know, you're important to this community. We care about you. Um, here's what you're doing that's harmful. Can we do a process with you? But in the meantime, can you stop self-promoting yourself? Like stop doing talks and like putting yourself up on stage as an expert. Like clearly you've got issues to work on before you put yourself out as an expert and gain power. Yeah. And I think people who have that, um, maybe like slightly narcissistic traits or like are a bit disconnected from themselves internally mm -hmm. might not know the difference between being told, Hey, don't be on stage. Just like be in the room, one of the many, you know, with everybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They might not know the difference between that and being shunned or yeah. canceled. Yeah. They might literally not know what you're talking about. Like, but the only way I can belong is if I'm on stage. You know? <laughs> or the only, yeah, the and only way I contribute. there are many ways to belong. Yeah. What? Or the only way I contribute. And when we, like, build models where some, I mean, no one is replaceable. Like, that's, that's, that's a given, but... Where like yeah. if someone's doing movement work or, or intellectual work or academic work or, or physical labor or whatever, like we should be trying to model our, our communities in ways where, you know, it's not just up to this one person who could fail at any time hypothetically or need a break or whatever else. Like putting it in like the best possible yeah. perspective if, if there's like, well, I just have yeah. these really important things to say and like, well, cool, like give the mic to someone else and like share your ideas and let someone else be the one vocalizing it for a while. Kill your own yeah, internal yeah, like, like subcommon yeah. Marcos, you know? Right. And there are lots of ways to be part of communities that don't accrue power, that just accrue relationship and trust, mm -hmm. which is so much more valuable than having individual power. Like the organizing spaces that I came up in, you know, for the most part as a white person in those spaces, sometimes we got asked to help strategize, but my job was to like fold the chairs, watch the kids, make the food. Like that's a beautiful role. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think, Oh, you know, I'm not really contributing that much because I'm not contributing to like strategy, but I'm not a good chess player. I'm really good at taking care of kids and fetching people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that's okay. Like there's lots of different roles and that created like long-term relationships that are much more meaningful and beautiful for me than, you know, the type that form when you're publishing articles and getting a reputation or getting famous, mm. um, which is sort of a skimming the surface type. You can, you can meet 
interesting people. But then relationship building is separate from that. It has to happen separately. Mm -hmm. And it's so important, especially right now, because our relationships of trust are what we have to protect us in these times that we're moving through now. If I like that, I have to build where I live and that I have to be accountable to people in relationship over the long term, like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, that that's, that's how real, um, account solidarity forms, um, where you can be like, yeah, you know, we might not be best friends, but like, if you're going to be deported, I will show up and I will surround the van and I will stop that. Or like, if you're, you know, those kinds of genuine things. And I think, you know, an interesting piece of it also is around like the quality, maybe in organizing spaces of a bit of having a bit of a scene, like trying to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> That I'm just I'm just so done with that. Like I'm not cool. I've never been cool. I'm a big nerd. <laughs> That's not true. I was cool for two years when I was eighteen and nineteen, and then it was over. <laughs> um, you know, and I think it's it's okay that a lot of us come to this because we're really soft people, um, or you know, gentle people who want a world that is livable for caring, kind people, and I think the world currently is being run by sociopaths and, like, that's just the reality of it. <laughs> um, and so how do we create care where all of the gifts and beauty that people are bringing into this world can grow and can be called on and can come out into the world? Like, we need to create culture that deeply sees each other and can really accept one another as we truly are. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that's, like, respecting people's pronouns, you know, is a tip of the iceberg, really seeing people for who they truly are all the way down. That's a completely different kind of culture. And I think that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping for when I say, you know, the opposite of that nurturance is the opposite of violence or the violence is nurturance turned backwards is like, it's not like, Oh, um, a direct opposite. It's much bigger. That acceptance is much bigger than rejection. This one body worker, this naturopath that I was working with said that to me one time when I was dealing with trying to, um, get rid of parts of myself that were doing things I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And I said, can't you just get rid of it? And she said, no, you have to accept it. And I said, how do I accept these parts of myself that feel so shameful? And she said, acceptance is not the opposite of rejection. Acceptance is much bigger than rejection. It's not like, oh yeah, you just accept mm -hmm. this bad thing that you're doing. It's that you accept your whole self. You love your whole self. And then you get more able to relate to other others in a more full, whole loving kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to expand that in all of these relationships where we're protecting one another to be accountable, but also to be really able to see each other as we truly are. Just the surfaces. Not in a simplistic way, not like, oh, we're all the same, kumbaya. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which is just white bullshit, but like in a really profound way of like, who are you actually? And even though we're different, how do we connect and take care of each other? I guess I was thinking to kind of wrap this up mm -hmm. on that point. Uh, I'd like to do a thing that like one of my one of the other like podcasters that I work with or that I'm friends with Tim who does the soul cast does mm -hmm. it, that I kind of like at the end of his episodes he asks people and particularly because uh, as you said like the this piece of work is a byproduct or is like a product of a lot of hands and a lot of brains over a lot of time yeah um, I wonder if there are any like uh, besides why does he do that if there are any titles that you might direct people for like further inquisition as particularly I'd like to hear if there are any titles in other attachment theory which we didn't get too deep into um, but I know there's mm -hmm. a lot of good books that have been written about it or the the physical mm -hmm. implications of in the um, limbic system of of shame mm -hmm. and stuff like that like I definitely want to read more on those topics but any sort of book recommendations that you want to throw out to the listenership I'm sure would be much appreciated originally came from there was a page called um, how to not re-injure survivors and that started out as just me trying to get good resources together for gendered violence but it grew from there and it's got a lot of different kinds of um, references about systemic violence and how to stand up to it in a way that humanizes everyone, but really does stand up to violence, whether it's coming from um, the state or coming from one another or coming from supply chains or coming from capitalism, wherever the source is of it, to be able to stand up and say, hey, I see this and it's not okay, mm -hmm. while also recognizing the humanity of all of the humans and and the living beingness of all the beings that are involved in all of these structures. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I see I pulled it up right here, so... It's very there you go yeah very good um how can people find your book 
They can find the book everywhere. AK Press is amazing and has a very, very wide distro. They can go to any little bookstore, any little local bookstore they want and ask for it, and they can get it in. Um, it's also available if they don't have it already. And actually, that's a big help if they call their local little bookstores. If they get a couple of requests, they're more likely to keep it in stock. Right. Um, and it's also in all the big bookstores, like the you know Barnes & Noble and whatever. Um, and they can also get it directly from AK Press. Um, for I believe there's even a discount if you go through the AK Press mm. currently. Um, if they live in the states, if you live elsewhere, it's a little trickier to get it directly from the publisher. So you better it's better to go through a bookstore. Mm. Like literally all over the world. That's part of what's so wonderful about AK is that this little radical anarchist publisher who distros globally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they do. They work so hard. Um, and they can also get it on the capital A evil machine place. But I won't should know. avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank you. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero network of anarchist podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You're listening to a Channel Zero network podcast. The Channel Zero network is a decentralized network of anarchist podcasts, bringing you analysis of current events, media criticism, rebellious music, interviews with academics and authors, how-tos, and so much more. This is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Saligi land in southern Appalachia. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. What's up, y'all? I'm Pearson, host of Coffee with Comrades. You've been listening to Rebel Steps. I'm your host, Liz. Believe in yourself, trust one another, and get organized. Hello, this is Linda. You're listening to Subversion 1312 on the Channel Zero Network. Whether you are anarcho-curious or a hardened militant, CZN's ever-growing roster of programs has something for you. Head over to channelzeronetwork.com to find out more. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.